Ned's right, nobody's seen it. Of course, he just gave half my speech, so we'll just tear up a few pages. <laughs> Chairman Dowling, President Beam, Reverend Fields, members of the stage party, trustees, faculty, staff, and especially students, families, and friends. Thanks to Charlotte Ravioli for getting me straight on the etiquette. It's been 35 years since the first speech class. And I'd hate to think that George Winnestein would be embarrassed. <laughs> if you were here in the 70s, you know who he was. I am here for many reasons, but mostly because I believe in giving back. In this case, specifically. For the support and encouragement from the people and the institu institution we all know as Keystone College, at a time in my life that mattered the most, I am grateful. When you get the chance to do the same, wherever you may go, grab it and give back. I came here as a first generation student, putting myself through college, a young widow with a sad face and a pathetic demeanor and no direction. The Keystone shored me up, dried my tears while spinning pots in Bill's class, letting me clean out the cement mixer in Cliff's class. It was my therapy. Carl's drawing classes let me combine my math logic and my art in perspective drawing, all of which put me on a path to self-confidence. You and your families have been through your own situations, making personal sacrifices, both financial and emotional, but have come to this day through the encouragement of others, your own hard work and determination. And you should be proud and, yes, grateful. Okay, enough of that. Now let's talk about doors. I know a lot about doors. Interior doors are an inch and three-eighths thick. Exterior doors are an inch and three-quarter inch thick. Most doors are eight inches high. Standard doors are 18 inches, 21, 24 inches wide, and on and on and on. I know a lot about doors. There are wood doors, steel doors, glass doors, modified density fiber doors, solid core doors, hollow core doors. There are garage doors, doggy doors, cabinet doors, shower doors, open doors, and closed doors. The last two are the ones you really want to pay attention to. I did grow up at Lake Winola from age nine with five siblings. Having moved from Tunkhannock to attend the fourth grade, my school was a place called Falls Overfield in Mill City until the 11th grade. And then I got to go home again to graduate from Tunkhannock High School in my senior year. My first door opened to me at age 11. A job opportunity came about at that age. I lied, saying I was 12. I was tall. And after all, it was in my 12th year, right? I was hired for $2 per day to clean a 10-room cottage at the lake and babysit their grandchildren for an additional dollar per day after cleaning. I was rolling in it by September. <laughs> my second door opened the next summer. I made a deal with my older brother to take over his paper route. He did not want it. At that time, the company would not give girls a paper route. You know, we can't carry heavy papers because we're girls, right? Well, the deal was that he could keep the paper company money and I get the tips. So he only had to help me on Sunday mornings when, yes, the papers were heavy. The next door opened for me at age 13. I got a visit from the owner of Topper's Diner in Clark Summit. Many of you may remember it to find out if I was ready to be a bus girl. My mother had worked there before, and they knew she had a daughter who was probably old enough to do that. State labor law says you have to be 14, so I lied. <laughs> I was tall. <laughs> and technically, I was in my 14th year, right? <laughs> Two years later, I was promoted to waitress. By the time I was a senior in high school, I had saved enough money to attend all the senior events and activities, buy my new school clothes, and pay for it myself. I married my high school sweetheart at age 18 after saving our money for 18 months to pay for an apartment full of new furniture, two relatively new cars, and all wedding expenses paid for in advance. I was driven. This was my first closed door. He had a car accident 18 months later and died. As an academic major and student in high school, I had taken my SATs with my junior class with no expectations to apply to college and without encouragement to do so from anyone. Did I say we were poor? So because my classmates took the exams, I took them. I scored high enough to enter various colleges, but did not apply. After all, I was getting married soon. Once my prescribed married life was derailed by my husband's sudden death, I applied to Keystone College. 
Thanks, Mom. And that was the fourth door that opened for me. The college interviewed me in the art department for my requested fine arts major. With a portfolio derived from what was at that time known as the home economics department in high school. Art was what we did in Girl Scouts and learned to cook and sew in the classroom. Carl Neuroth, whom some of you know well, interviewed me and accepted me on a provisional basis. And in my first semester, I achieved a 3.97 GPA, which was the disappointing result of a half credit billiards course I was required to take. <laughs> <laughs> I managed to receive a 4.0 each semester thereafter and graduated summa cum laude. The next door to open was acceptance into Syracuse University. At Syracuse, I attended the Fine Arts School and graduated with my BFA and major in interior design from their FIDER accredited program. This program was taught in conjunction with the architecture school and the industrial design department. Between my art background at Keystone and my program at Syracuse, I was taught to draw 2D and think in 3D. It has made all the difference in the way I think and design and the way my contemporaries think and design. The next summer, the sixth door opened for me. I applied to work for a nationally recognized architectural firm in Clark Summit and excelled there. I loved it. I was sent on projects all over the country in that four months time. And before I left to return for my final semester, I was offered full-time employment with the firm. Now remember that I was putting myself through college. And in my program at Syracuse as a transfer student, I needed to take a fifth semester to get their last required class to graduate. My new firm did not want me to leave after the summer and ask me to stay. But I had to get my name on that diploma. You know how that goes, right? The head of the firm asked me how I was going to pay for my expenses, knowing that my grants, scholarships, and loans had run out and I would not qualify for help. I told him I was going to get a job and take one class. He handed me a check for $5,000 and told me to take as many classes as I wanted and not to get a job. The terms were that I could pay him back whenever I could, no interest, and to show up for work on January 2nd to report for my full-time position. I paid him back in two years with a single check. I returned to work that January 2nd, and within four months they asked me to relocate to Manhattan to work on a Revlon project on Fifth Avenue. Ah, this was my next door. They had someone deliver me to a corporate apartment on 46th Street and handed me a key, and gave me a map on a napkin indicating where to report for work the next morning on Park Avenue. I was 25. I had been to New York only twice before in my life, and I knew no one. I was within walking distance to the office, so walked to work the next day. But on the way, as luck would have it, a pigeon shit on my head. <laughs> so when I arrived, it was not my best presentation. I washed my hair in the ladies' room, and I settled into their office for the next four years. I was assigned the role to oversee the renovation and space planning of 10 floors in the General Motors building on Fifth Avenue for Revlon. In due course, I was also assigned the role of interior design project manager for a new building in Edison, New Jersey, again for Revlon. The task was to relocate 1,200 people from their Manhattan address to New Jersey into a new 250,000 square foot building with a master plan for an additional 200,000 square foot building attached later for the research and development department. I had a blast. While handling that project, I was also working on projects for IBM in North Carolina and in Palo Alto, California, and ITT in Shelton, Connecticut, and some various others. This was a four-year endeavor before I had been approached personally to do some office space planning for companies in Manhattan. This was my next door, number eight. The first time it happened, I turned the job over to the firm I worked for. The second time it happened, I bought a drafting table and a fax machine, and I put it in my dining room and I started my own business. I was encouraged to do so by a New York entrepreneur whom I married 10 years later, which was my next open door. My career blossomed for the next 10 years before another closed door hit me in the face. My husband was diagnosed with cancer and died within the year. I threw myself into my business and it grew until the current economic crisis hit our country and the world. All the small business owners have been juggling to stay afloat in this economy. And we have had to be prudent, creative, and aggressive in keeping our businesses thriving until the world gets on solid ground. Those challenges are still with us, but those with solid foundation have seen some hope for growth in the recent past. I now have an office in Chelsea, New York, with a staff of seven and run two corporations. 
The entrepreneurial bug got me at age 11, but I didn't know it then. I couldn't even spell it then. I once gave a talk to high school art students and their parents right here on this campus when I was 35. Someone asked me what I liked the best about being in my own business. My reply was, I get to decide which 15 hours of the day I get to work, not my boss. Make no mistake, the road to this place has been paved with sweat, hard work, and long hours. The current economic times have made business owners timid and hesitant to grow, but there will be doors to open, and when they do, you have to walk through them. I made the decisions I did to get to this place because I never wanted to look back and say, I wonder what would have happened if. My hope for each and every one of you is that you find those doors and walk through them. Doors don't lose hope when one door closes because another door opens. Never let that closing door hit you in the ass. And just keep your sights on the next open door and walk through it with confidence. Thank you and congratulations. like is you were nominated for our chair Harry Dowling and the Board of Trustees confirmed that you now have an honorary doctorate degree from Keystone College. Another door we hope you'll think and believe because we do that you open. <laughs>